start again. Um, hello everyone, we've only got two oops, that's jumping up now, 30 attendees, 33. We'll wait until, I'll wait until this gets, gets up a little bit. 46, okay. So, uh, my name is Oliver Craig, Regional Chair for the Emerald Professionals in the Northeast, and as you can see, the man with the bushiest eyebrows in the North. Uh, I'm really excited that today we are joined by two of our industry's leaders, John Reed, Industry Programme Director, the Transpen and Upgrade, the Network Rail, and Tim Wood, the Director of Northern Powerhouse Rail at Transport for the North. For our second online event, our speakers will give insight into what it takes to run these major projects and programs. Questions for this event will be focused around how have recent changes in government given new energy to these programs? Why are these programs absolutely necessary? And what opportunities and challenges do such programs present? And that's in levelling up the North with real programs. Um, I'd like to request that those that have time fill out a short survey with three questions that will jump on their screen when we close this webinar. This will help us improve our future events and it will help us understand what, what it is you're looking forward to see in the future. Um, so during this webinar, we'll be taking questions which we'll collate and we'll put to the speakers in a Q&A following the talks. With no further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John Reed. Hi, Ollie, and th thanks very much. Um, can I just check you can see and hear me okay? I can, I can see you and hear you, John, brilliant. Thank you. And should we go to the first slide then and get started? Just, just while Oliver does that, I'll just say thanks very much for inviting me to speak this evening. It's a pleasure to sort of be here in a strange sort of way. Um, and I should also disclose that um, Oliver's in my team at Network Rail, so I feel a sort of very particular and strange pressure not to, to let him down. Um, so I, I hope I do. Uh, do manage to do a good job. Um, given the format today and the fact that we're all no doubt hundreds of miles apart, um, I'll, I'll keep my talk a little bit shorter than I was asked um, and suggest that instead we pick up the things you're interested in um, during fresh questions and discussions later. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my background and what I've done before I got to this role why the Trans Pennine Route Upgrade Programme exists, what it's aiming to do, and a little bit about what I've been up to in the last month or so, actually. Um, Oliver was keen that we shared some of the reality of the day job within the programme, so uh, I'm just going to share some of the, the pain and progress in the last month uh, with uh, trying to get some money, uh, effectively. Um, so, Ollie, let's move on to the next slide, please. Right, thanks. Please. So here's um, you know, a couple like of logos job. to give you. Okay, thanks, Ollie. Um, so look, these are the sort of key places I've worked over the over the years. I'm um, sort of coming up to about 20 years uh, since graduating. Um, my very first role was as a graduate trainee on the underground, um, which was a fantastic role working in an integrated railway, um, which is quite rare in the UK, uh, including a bit of time as a station supervisor at Paddington Station, which was the most terrifying job I've ever done and taught me that operations is not for me, but it gives me a, a, a huge sense of what the people who do those jobs deal with. Um, I then pretty quickly got into the world of upgrades and enhancements, whether it was step-free access schemes, um, new rolling stock, uh, signaling kit for the, the tube, uh, all of which were hugely rewarding. Um, I, I then, for all my sins, spent a few years in some management consultancy covering transport and other areas. Um, before joining the Department for Transport, uh, where I spent a good old decade actually um, covering their work, their role in franchising um, and more recently enhancements. Um, and then towards the end of last year, I, I felt like a change uh, and have moved to Network Rail to take this industry program director role for the Trans Pennine Route upgrade. So I, I'm fairly fresh into it, but um, 
it, it, it's not uh, it's been a roller coaster and it's been great fun and there's a lot to do um and i guess just before i get going i just wanted to share a few things about having done all those roles what what's the thread between them and what motivates me and what do i actually care about doing them and i think it boils down to three things really first is um i, I really care about finding a way to spend public money well um in railways it's so easy to talk about millions of pounds and with tru it's billions of pounds um but but we need to be careful because you know people who work with me will know that i often say I'll come home on a Friday and I've got an email from my children's school asking for a donation of five pounds to fix the repairs on the wall and the roof. Um, so I'm really conscious about how much money we, we have to spend and that we need to do the right thing. Um, secondly, our, it's clearly important that we've got to sort make some changes to, to how we impact the environment. So that's that's really clear. Rail, rail has a great opportunity. Um, green technology in the railways, a, an electric system with no emissions is old technology. Uh, uh, very little land use, very energy efficient. There's a great role for railways going forwards. Um, and finally, I love the people side of the jobs, growing people, teams, organisations, and also bringing them together to do great things, um, which is all about, um, for me, how these programmes work. Um, so I hope I can bring some of this to, to TIU. So um, speaking of which, let, let's look at why we're doing it. Um, Oli, can we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so I guess the obvious place to start is why on earth is the Trans-Pennine route upgrade or TRU here? What are we trying to do? Um, well, there's a couple of things that I brought out on the slide here. Um, you know, you can see from the map that I took from Google earlier today that even today when um, I imagine there's not very many cars on the road, um, it's a good hour and a half from the city so for a journey of just over 70 miles. Um, Actually, you can imagine what that's like in the peak. You know, two, two and a half hours is not uncommon on a busy day. Um, railways are a bit quicker, but they're still fairly slow. Uh, and actually, you, you know, the time it takes you to get from York to Manchester on the railway isn't that different from how long it takes you to get from either to London, um, which is kind of just astonishing when you think about the distances involved. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, like most of the network, passenger demand has doubled in the last 20 or so years, um, which is a fantastic success story. But clearly, in jobs like mine, you only see the downside, which is um, that you've got a problem with crowding and you need to do something about it. Um, and to help in the short term, uh, DFT has asked the Trans Pennine Express franchise operator to increase its frequencies and increase the length of the train so there's more seats. Uh, and you, you've probably seen those if you live in the area and they've been well received by passengers. Um, but fundamentally, this railway is a country lane. It's a rambling, ancient railway that's not had any love or care for a long while. Um, so it performs poorly um, day in, day out. People don't know when they're getting home. Um, and, and that means that you know we're not offering a service that any of us can be proud of. Um, as well as an old route, it, trains run under diesel traction, so they cause harmful emissions to the cities they pass through and the routes. on um, and there's a demand from passengers and the government that the performance and the capacity problems need to be solved as quickly to create that list of problems just by looking at the railway but what we the sort of thread that runs through my presentation is how we link with the government to justify our funding um, so the way this works in government as i'm sure you'll be aware is we need to establish a business case uh, for the reasons we should do it against the costs um, and the good news for the program we're working on at the moment is our analysis with the department shows that um, we're just shy of a, a benefit cost ratio of about 1.5 to 1, which in simple terms um, tells the government that for every pound they spend on the Trans Pennine route upgrade, they'll receive about £1.50 back in fares and wider socio-economic value. Um, so that's actually a really, uh, really decent number for a scheme like this, a bit scheme as large as this with the fares and the region of the UK. Um, officially, in the Treasury parlance, it is a low value for money scheme, just about, um, and we've clearly got a job to do to keep that um, number trying to get better. Um, but it's just one part of the business case, actually, and it's really one of the really important things that I, I like about TIU is that it's got a huge role to play in creating a fairer society. Um, it's got a huge role to play in decarbonisation uh, and a huge role to play 
in helping people choose public transport as their mode of choice. So let's look at the next slide, please. So this next slide, which I'll assume we'll look at shortly, um, picks out a few headlines about what the Trans-Pennine route upgrade actually is. Um, so look, it's a multi-billion pound modernization. Um, actually, plus or minus a few hundred million pounds, it's a four billion pound scheme that will be delivered um, over the next eight years, um, which in industry jargon is control period six and seven. Um, as I say, the key difference the key aim for the program is to help resolve oh. capacity and performance problems uh, that passengers suffer from every day, reduce the environmental impact. Um, your, I think your yeah. um, webcam is slowing down the broadcast slightly, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to switch that off and see if it makes a difference to the transfer of audio. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, ahead. is that better, Ollie? Yeah, that's better. We'll we'll continue like that. Cheers, John. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope I hope you got some of that. Um, and it's probably better not seeing me. Um, so look, um, and actually, it's what's notable is the first kind of really really major rail project in the region for a long time. Um, and it's worth as an aside just taking a step out and looking at transport in London and the southeast here. Um. Because I guess what I've noticed coming to TIU is that there's a lot of debate about what is the right scheme to invest in the north. Um, and it's kind of the wrong question, really, because I think there's not just one scheme. And my parallel would be if you look at London, there's no situation at the moment where TfL and the Department for Transport position the upgrade of the tube versus crossrail versus franchise improvements as, as choices. Um, there's, a, there's a logic to how they fit together and I think we've got to learn from how they do that with local stakeholders to try and um, show how the improvements we're making both now and in the long term actually are all really important. Um, so let's look and see a bit about what TRU means um, in particular. So what this next slide shows when it appears is um, what we've been asked to do by the department. So we've got, they're our client for this work uh, and the remit they've set us at the moment is to increase the frequency of trains on this route. So at the moment we run six trains and the ask is to run eight trains per hour. That's one additional long distance service and one commuter or local service. Um, looking to keep freight as it is, but we're working with them at the moment to look at how we might do better on that. A really interesting one is they asked for performance of 92 and a half. And they actually were more specific than the, the national measure. They wanted uh, a certain list of stations, 90 schedule, uh, which is a really high challenge, which we don't yet think we can meet. Um, and then there's some journey time challenges as well to bring down. Uh, Manchester to Leeds down to 43 minutes um, and Manchester to York down to 67 minutes, a reduction of around seven or so minutes in either way. Um, and if you look at this slide, you get a feel for the complexity of the route. Um, there's six miles of tunnels, um, three miles of viaducts. Uh, right in the middle of the route, a really busy station, Huddersfield is grade one listed. Um, there's 29 level crossings. So you just get a sense of the immense engineering uh, and the age of this railway and going in to try and turn it. Um, perhaps not into the most glorious mainline railway, but into a really high quality regional route. I, I kind of tend to think of TRU as ch turning a country lane into a dual carriageway. Um, you know, perhaps NPR is the motorway if you follow that logic. Um, and so there's a lot to do. And what we're working with the DFT to do now is to look at, is to reevaluate some of these aims, given we now know how much some of them price and where some of them are easier and some of them are harder. Um, and, I, you know, one of the challenges that we always have, and I'll kind of leave, leave to, perhaps to people on the call to have a think about, is how does the, if you're sat in the department, how do you specify what the performance of the railway is? Um, you know, at the moment they've come to the to network rail, which runs the infrastructure, and said 92.5%, but the performance of the railway isn't just infrastructure, of course. It, it takes in rolling stock, it takes in the operational performance, it takes in the design of the timetable. 
It takes in uh, the franchisee's obligation to the department. Um, and so actually, if you're sat in the department, how do you specify performance for the railway in a way that works? Or, or maybe you can't, and maybe that's part of what's behind our decline in performance we've seen nationally. Um, it, there's better brains than me can surely unpick that. Um, if we look at the next slide, Ollie, please. Um, slide, um, I'll just give you a sense for the enormity of who's involved in all of this. Um, so look, lot, lots of logos and pictures on here. What can we pick out? Um, so look, clients and funder, the department, it's all paid for by taxpayers and fair payers, um, every single penny. Um, you, you'll see a little bit more detail on the capacity there, aiming for 3,120 seats per hour um, when we finish, which will be around four times what was there a couple of years ago. Um, if you look on the right hand side, you see there's a really big supply chain. Um, you know, there are companies on there like Jacobs and uh, of Amy, Arup, Murphy, huge companies. Um, and we've had to kind of draw them together into, into groups. So we've set them up as two alliances. Um, and we're really working closely with them to help us design and deliver the upgrade in, involving all of those people. Um, and finally, there's a lot of people with an interest in this uh, who aren't part of the supply chain, but um, you know, people like Transport for the North, Rail North, uh, the franchisees, the passengers, uh, and clearly freight operators as well. Um, and you know, so many people use this route who have a say in it and have an interest in it that we need to work closely with them. And that's something we're hoping to get better at as we go. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll just dwell on this one briefly. I included it just for people to take a look at afterwards if, if they were interested. Um, this just sets out in a bit more detail some of the economic, uh, stakeholder, government aims and environmental impacts. Um, so I'm not going to go through it now, but you're very welcome to take a look at that later if, if you want more information. So Ollie, let's look at the next one, please. Thank you. So look, I just wanted to sort of finish with a, a couple of minutes on what actually this means in terms of a job uh, for someone like me, um, because it's, it's often quite impenetrable getting from these big headlines about multi-billion pound schemes in so What do you all do every day? Um, and to the extent I've ever managed to work that out, um, I'll just share my last month or so, which is to unlock funding for the next stage of TRU. Um, and so this really ties me into this new thing called the Rail Network Enhancements Pipeline, um, which is the worst acronym I've ever come across, RNEP. Um, so forgive me for saying it, but it's become part of my language. Um, and this is the process the Department for Transport runs to gradually release funding to railway projects. Um, so a bit of a history lesson first. How, how did we end up with this? Um, you don't have to go too far back in history to um, control periods four and five in the last five and ten years to see that actually at one point in time the government would release a check of uh, you know 10 billion pounds say for enhancements and leave the rail industry to crack and do it best um, and there were great advantages to this in terms of moving to give these kinds of multi-year programs the financial confidence and uh, uh, base baseline to deliver um, but around 2015 it kind of went wrong really for the government because there were significant increases across the portfolio largely caused by electrification um, uh, and it left the Department for Transport with something like a four billion pound black hole in its finances when numbers kept on rising um, uh, and there was no, no clarity from the department's perspective and the government's perspective that the money was being well managed and controlled. Um, so very sadly for the rail industry um, the, the government lost lost all faith in its ability to manage and control large projects. Uh, and what you see here in this pipeline is the consequence of that. It's a process whereby in each of those diamonds, which are big gateways to get through, the government and the treasury and the department will, will stop the project and think for as long as they need to, to land what they want um, and to go the right way. So that's the sort of consequence. And, you know, uh, and I guess from my time in government, it, it's clear that Trust to spend public money is something that has to be earned over a long, long time through repeatedly doing it well. And unfortunately, the, the sort of troubles of control period far John, I've just lost you at 2015. I'll take us a long way 
um, to recover from. So, can you hear me now again, Ollie? Yeah, I can hear you now. I think I don't know if the, the rest of the audience. Can you hear me now, Ollie? Yes, I can. I don't know if the, the audience lost you, but I lost you at control period five, John. Apologies. That's okay. I'll, 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 I'll try and pick up best I can. Um, okay. Um, so, so to my mind, this process the department have now for funding has become the life of many of us in the industry, and it tries to balance four things in my mind. Um, firstly, clarity and control of what what's coming. There's a really clear process which has a very long document on their website that you can look at. And the benefit for the department of that is it avoids announcing commitments when they're just ideas. So the department felt it wasn't right to announce Great Western Electrification of a very, very simple short piece of work, which is what they did. So now every, every project will be repeatedly announced as it goes through these gateways, which is a kind of boon for politicians who like to re-announce things at the very least. Um, the politics of this is really important. I think we need to be realistic about the railways and the government. Um, people often say to me that we need to find a way for the rail industry to move away from the government um, and run its own world. But my sense is given the money that the government puts into the industry, it's never just going to do that and say goodbye. The, the government and the economy and society tie together so closely with the industry that we're always going to be working hand in hand with the, some sort of government body. Um, in terms of the funds available, um, it, it, we've got into a very fortunate situation that despite what happened in 2015 with the funding problems, the government's remained committed to around about a 10 billion pound enhancement budget for control period uh, per control period um, for the existing network that excludes things like high speed two and crossrail and so on uh, and it's a fantastic opportunity for the industry and one that we should never take for granted um, you don't have to find people who are too old to find that their, their entire railway careers were about doing more with less and closing things is down um, so we should never take for granted that you know the money that we do have um, finally it needs to balance the future needs of the country you know fortunately rail is growing certainly pre-coronavirus um, and we hope, hope that comes back and is becomes more popular um, but where will people be where will people work where will they live how will they travel these are all really big questions uh, and this this pipeline system the government has set up is their kind of slightly clunky way of trying to manage that so if we go on to the next slide um, it looks rather like this one um, but where we are with TIU now is that decision to design um, box so my last few months have been spent there so just to summarize we've we've had to go through a shed load of board meetings as the summary we went to the network rail board in March uh, the department's board in uh, and the Treasury's uh, gateway board in April um, it's now completed its official level sort of civil service network rail staff world and it's entered the realm of politics so the secretary of state for transport the chancellor chief secretary for the uh, treasury uh, i suspect even the prime minister might give it a few minutes um it's now in the world of politics and we're looking for smoke signals at some point in june around how the next stage may um proceed uh, of course this is all immense and challenging and, and of course it should be because the sums involved are truly extraordinary compared to um, many other industries um, and so far the signs are looking very positive from the government so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll have good news next month. Um, so just to wrap up with my final slide please Ollie, um, I hope that the connection problems mean you didn't lose too much and that it's been of interest to you um, and as a very final thought um, TRU is a growing program and it's growing in the department, in train companies, in network rail, in uh, TFM and we're over the next year or so there'll be more and more roles available uh, coming out so if it is an interesting program for you do keep in touch with me keep in touch with ollie because he works on it too um and as i think the coronavirus has shown us the location no longer matters um thank you very much ollie and i, I hope you got uh, the gist of that despite the connectivity troubles hi john no no we, we it was a really good presentation thank you very much um I just a couple of things on your presentation. I think it wouldn't be true to our railway um, industry if we weren't to come up with um, obscure acronyms such as ONET. Um, 
another thing just obviously in my time working on the transparent upgrades i think uh the things that you mentioned around the politics obviously <laughs> seeing seeing you come in from the dft um i think it demonstrated to a lot of people how important that aspect is for the success of a program uh, like this but yeah no, thank you very much john really appreciate that um we're now going to move on to uh, tim wood director of northern powerhouse rail and uh, Tim, what slide would you like me to select for your presentation? Oh, in actual fact, I think just just take it as a visual. Uh, do you want the um, this one here? Yep, that'd be absolutely fine. Brilliant. Cheers, Tim. Um, do you want to show your camera? So you are already. Sorry. <laughs> cheers, cheers, Tim. I let you go. All right. Well, look. Thank you very much, Ollie um, and YRP. I am delighted to speak to you finally. Uh, I know it wasn't uh, uh, good last time when we tried. Unfortunately, I didn't have any any audio, but uh, but tonight I do. So uh, I want to start right from the beginning. So for us in Transport for North and Northern Powerhouse Rail uh, and all our programmes in Transport for North, it's about developing a thriving north of England, where we have two key mantras. That's increasing the GVA, the gross value add, by 100 billion and also increasing full fixed time jobs by 850,000 over what we have today. And this is to be done by 2050. So our programs lead up to that. So in the south of England, there are around 8 million people. Southeast of England. In the north of England, there's around 16 million people. We produce half the GVA in the north at just over 300 billion than they do in the southeast of England at 600 billion. That just cannot be right. And this is why we're looking to level up the north against the south. And the way you're going to do that is through the railways and through inward investment. So opening up the capacity and the connectivity of the network. And what are the programs? Well, HS2, TRU and NPR were economic programs. We're not just transport per se. You want to move large amounts of people around the north as quickly as possible. And in this 21st century, what do we all want? We want a seat. We want some connectivity on the train. We want the train to leave on time and to arrive on its destination on time. So an example, Bradford to Leeds. It's around eight miles. Today, it takes 26 minutes. So that's half a million people in Bradford taking 26 minutes if they wanted to go to Leeds. Is that right? I don't think so. My view would be eight miles, eight minutes. So that's why we come along after, tra after TRU, which is vitally important. We absolutely support it. We want to see that built as quickly as possible. And that major stepping stone into Northern Powerhouse Rail. So Northern Powerhouse Rail is about connecting the key six city regions and Manchester International Airport. So we've got Liverpool, Leeds, Hull, Newcastle, Sheffield and Manchester. But there's also intermediate key economic centres that we'll be connecting like Warrington and Bradford. So for me living in Lancaster, if I want to get over to Leeds, normally an hour from Lancaster down to Manchester and then up to Leeds, we'll be taking half an hour off that. If I'm already living in Manchester and I want to go to Leeds, Currently, as um, the diagram was showing there earlier, it's sort of 49 minutes. We believe we can do that in 25 minutes. We believe we can do that with six trains an hour in each direction. And potentially those trains traveling at in excess of 125 miles an hour. So the program overall has a budget of around 39 billion pounds. That's what we're asking the government to provide us with so we can actually complete this program but we've got a long way to go yet before we get that we're still making the case so we're in early strategic outline case mode at the moment and that piece of work this year because we've re received 75 million pounds with a grant funding is all about getting a preferred network so it's split down NPR into seven corridors five corridors are already on network rail existing infrastructure and two are new corridors a brand new line going from Liverpool via Warrington to Manchester and a brand new line from Manchester through 
Bradford, and then on to Leeds. And what we need to do is to whittle down the concepts on new lines and the options. So you can imagine at very early stage, we just have some lines on a map at the moment. And as we drill down through a sifting process, we will get to a preferred network that will go in our strategic outline case. We also want to agree a phasing strategy. How are you going to build this network? So does Leeds start first to Manchester or does Liverpool to Manchester start first? Well, actually, it's predominantly going to be driven by the consent procedure. So on network rail infrastructure, the consents may be less. We don't need a hybrid bill, but we may need a DCO. But hopefully on some of this work, we'll actually be down to the Transport and Works Act or other permitted development rights to get building. So we don't want to wait until we've got all the permissions in place to build NPR out. But the one thing we do want to do is we want to start in 2024. And at the moment, we're looking towards Leeds to Hull to actually get that corridor going first. In the meantime, we will be developing new lines out. We will be either going through a hybrid bill or a DCO process through Parliament or through the Secretary of State, coming out the other end with the permissions, then going and buying the land, surveys, design, and then into construction. All these corridors are billion plus corridors. So where John was talking there about the 2.9 billion for TRU, we're up to that 39 billion pounds. And that 39 billion was the most transformational network. And those figures were at Q1 2015. So of course you'll already have inflation added onto that for the program. But the key senior team in Transport for North, we're actually like on the bridge of a massive oil tanker. We're trying to steer that into steady waters all the time. We have costs moving all over the place. We have benefits moving all over the place because the work is in development. So new solutions, new innovations are coming through all the time. And what we want to do is to land all this in a strategic outline case. So preferred network, phasing options, and then the actual document itself. And we'll be taking that document to a Transport for North Board on the 10th of March, 2021, for approval. Once we get approval from the board, it will then go into the department and into ministers, and then we will wait for an instruction from there. But where do we want to go? We absolutely want to move into outline business cases, and then after that, full business case, so we can get out there and get building. We can't afford to stand around. We know in the north of England, there's been massive underinvestment over the last four decades. So we really want to get on with this program. And I've always said, I only want an A team on this. It's not because there's a problem with a B or a C team. It's just that we haven't got enough time. The overcrowding, the lack of train capacity, and the actual slowness of what we're left with in the north here, basically a twin track railway, is just clearly not acceptable to our politicians and our great folk of the north. So what are you looking at in reality? Well, you're looking at a 20 year work bank and that 20 year work bank will not be, as we've all been used to, a boom and bust railway work bank. It will be a continuous work bank. It'll be a continuous work bank for people that want to develop their careers, companies that want to develop their business and their supply chains. And also it'll be a work bank that will help us with decarbonization. We will not accept anything but full electrification on the NPR network. We absolutely welcome um, hydrogen trains, battery powered trains, but the pulling power we need for the North because of the gradients, we need it fully electrified. And what does that do? That decarbonization agenda, it brings it forward. So the electric train, full electrification, and the way that we build the job as well. I really want to push the boundaries. I need you on this call to help us do that. You're the young rail professionals. You're the up and coming body that will actually support and generate and finish off the building of NPR. I can't put it any more plainly than that. We are one big rail family, but as John said, the treasury put us on the naughty step and the naughty step because the budgets were being blown, 
the programs were being blown on a number of large schemes and clearly it wasn't acceptable. And the bottom line was that you and I were paying for it through our taxes. So we want to make sure that we remain on program and on budget. And that's clearly down to all of us, not just the senior management team. So how are we progressing? Well, I said to you about 2024, but clearly that has now not floated our boat. We want to be out there this year and we will be out there this year because what I want to do is I want to start the surveys, not just to fly through with a Land Rover with a camera on it and something flying up in the air called a drone. I want to be out there on intrusive surveys. I want to understand what's in the troughs. I want to understand what the UTXs are like. I want to understand where we would put the masts in terms of electrification for the first corridor. If that's successful and driving down what is known as an optimism biased, so a strategic outline case, the 39 billion includes 66% of risk, basically. That's our optimism biased. The sooner we get out there and the sooner we understand what we're dealing with in terms of the ground conditions, because the most expensive thing on the railway is do you own the land? If you don't, then you have to buy it. And as HS2 have found, it's very expensive buying land. The second thing is the quality of the land. You need to understand that land, the geology, how it functions, will it, what, you know, what size uh, foundations would you need to actually uh, put a longer a route uh, to, uh, to hold your maths up. So there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done early on. And we're trying to bring that forward even more uh, than you would do normally. So let's get out there and do the surveys. If that works for the single route leads to Hull, we look to um, develop those into the other network rail corridors. In the meantime, we're carrying on with development work on the new lines. So there's whole pieces of work that are well underway. And spending the 75 million that we have uh, grant funded for this year, we've come a long way from when I started. You know, it's five million pounds a year. So there's been a real massive increase um, in confidence in the government in what we're doing. So we want to reward that and thank them for that in terms of actually delivering what we say we will on the date that we say we're going to do it. And although there has been a slight slippage when going to the March board rather than the January board, you know, that's been predominantly around COVID-19 and the issues that some of our partners and our delivery uh, agents have actually um, suffered through that awful pandemic that we're going through at the moment. So TRU, stepping stone to NPR. But then we've now got this high speed north, the integrated rail plan. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is how does HS2, 2B, NPR, TRU, and any other major schemes in the north dovetail together? Because we could end up trying to boil an ocean here. And then we, what I mean by that is the diversion routes, the diversion routes that TRU want to use. Well, if NPR is starting towards the middle to the back end of TRU, we might need those diversion routes as well to be able to send those trains around and make sure that the north continues to move. We want to think about the synergies of cost savings. We want to think about the synergies of the available workforce because these modern railway schemes are not necessarily about boots on ballast. They're about the software engineers. They're about the bright young minds that you are listening to this, the innovations that you will bring to the railway. I want to make it far more mechanized. So track relaying trains, can a track relaying train behind the back of it put the overhead line mass structures in as well? How will this all come to pass that we can move really quickly? Because these schemes go on for far too long. There's too much preferential engineering. We set the parameters. We do exactly what it says on the tin. And I think, again, you know, this is all about being collaborative. So if we're not open, we're not honest and we're not collaborative, then you're probably not working on NPR. We have no secrets within our senior team. We pass all our emails around together and we work as one functioning body. So anybody on NPR, I don't care who they work for, their ultimate employer. What's really important is that person and how that person bakes into the overall aims and goals of the program itself. So that's why the IRP is really important because those programs of phase 2B, TRU, how they bake in. We may need 
some of TRU to actually complete some of our network. I can definitely tell you that we need 80 kilometers of the high speed two network to be able to build NPR. So when there was talk of, will HS2 go north? Well, if it didn't, we'd need an extra 13 billion pounds on the NPR number to actually do the infills. And I think it's been really, really important to say the government has invested, even though the numbers are quite eye watering for HS2 in the start of that and the go ahead and that notice that was provided to start the civils works, the 12 billion pounds of the civils works with the JVs. So we've got to remember they've started in the south and we absolutely need to be ready up here in the north of England. So that integration, pulling it together, how does the uh, ETCS system work? Is there any handover? How does the track speeds work? Uh, the classic compatible HS2 trains running on the network rail and also the NPR infrastructure. How will that work? The gauge clearance, all the other great things. And of course, we're talking here predominantly about passenger trains. But actually, as Andrew Haynes would say, passenger first means freight. So how does freight pass? How does TRU eventually get gauge clearance for W10, W12? And how will TRU work in harmony with the new line between Leeds and Manchester via Bradford? So there's still a lot of problem solving, an awful lot of issues in front of us, but actually talking collaboratively, developing these solutions out and making sure that we have enough people to deliver these schemes is the way forward. So in a nutshell, potential of 80 billion pounds worth of work in the north of England. John said, it's an eye-watering number. I can't even comprehend a billion pounds, let alone 80 billion pounds. But it's all your careers for the future. This is setting your lives up for the future. And you come and join us, you come and work with us, you come and support us. You know, I won't be the rail director for the rest of my life. There'll be another rail director, there'll be another senior team as we finish, because as you know, 50% of the existing workforce in railway within the next 15 years will have retired. So it's up to you to pick up the mantle and pick up the mantle now, get embedded in these schemes and able to help and support us. And I think YRP is an absolute key organization because it's the way that we can quickly get to the youngsters to be able to say, these are the key messages. This is what we're doing. These are the opportunities coming up. Um, and we definitely uh, want to continue on with those messages so you know what's actually happening up in the north. But once we've done this, we've built it, we've finished it, what you'll find is far greater capacity, far greater connectivity, brand new 200 odd meter trains on the NPR network uh, running across the north. You'll see journey times slashed between all the key city regions and the fact that an extra 9 million people would be able to get to Manchester Airport within 90 minutes. Those sort of key stats, 35,000 extra peak time seats on the NPR network over business as usual today, 64,000 cars off the road every day down to the NPR network, and it's a fully electrified system. Very important stats. We're going to leave a legacy in the north. They left a legacy 200 years ago and we just want to build a world-class railway. So our time has come now in the North and we'd love you to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, Tim. That was a really, really interesting talk, very engaged. I'm gonna turn uh, your mic on again, John, if, you'd, if you'll let us, and we'll move into the Q&A. Self-muted, John. You need to click the um, the the. There we go. Um, I, John, do you, should we should should we do um, this with your camera on, or should we try and smooth out the audio and just leave the camera on for me and Tim? It's up to you. Uh, I honestly don't know, Ollie. Whatever you think's best. Okay, we'll leave it like this because I think you know the the, the words are the most important thing. Um, okay. So thank thank you, John. Uh, but both really great um, talks and and presentation, John. I pr appreciate appreciate your time. Uh, really fantastic to sort of hear from the top how you know how the the different perspective compared to what we see in our positions. Obviously, we're ambitious, but we um, we often don't see the politics 
and um, the decision making uh, at your level. So we'll go straight into the questions and we'll start with a question for both speakers. Um, can you comment on the potential overlap of the TRU and Northern Powerhouse rail schemes between Manchester and Leeds and how the two are integrating and collaborating to ensure, ensure efficiency? as well as not doubling up on the schemes. And I'll give that to you first, Tim, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem at all. So um, systems operator uh, working with uh, IP and uh, their support, which is Mott McDonnell, um, we're having constant conversations with them and with the TRU team. Uh, so I particularly meet Chris Montgomery uh, and Ian Quick just to understand where their program is, um, how the dovetail uh, is working, and also, uh, within Transport for North, we have a strategic rail part of our business, which actually is um, already embedded in the TRU team. But I think there's a really interesting question there. So let's just drive that a little bit further and unpack it. So we are looking at how you could run a four trains an hour MPR and a four trains an hour, these are fast trains an hour TRU. So you've got eight trains over what you've got business as usual today which is really the four fasts, how that would work. The problem is never the constraint in actually the infrastructure once it's completed between the key city stations. It's when you start arriving at the station that the problem is. So you've rushed all the way there at 125 mile an hour, but you can't get into the station because it's too constrained. So Leeds is already heavily constrained at the moment. There's a lot of work needs to be done around there which we're relying on TRU to be completed. So we will come in with our platform works. At Manchester Piccadilly, well, where do you want me to start? 2018, what a catastrophe that, that timetable change was. It absolutely knocked the north for six. And I think still we're feeling the ramifications now. So my pushback there would be, when I wait getting through the Castlefield corridor every day, because too many trains are going through that corridor. Early infrastructure works need to be done now to sort that corridor out. Whether it's stage C, which was platform 15, 16, or whether it's some other interventions, but we need to get them sorted now. So when MPR comes through, we actually have that through run into each of these uh, city region main stations. So a lot of collaboration going on. We're in this all together. Thank you very much, Tim. John, would you like to take that question? Yeah, yeah, and I'd certainly echo uh, a lot of what Tim said. I, I guess there's a couple of thoughts I'd add to it. Is you know, to some extent, people who try to force the north of England to choose the scheme it wants are, are setting up a, 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 an unfair question. I, I don't think. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at motorways and dual carriageways and A roads, I think we all comprehend how those different types of roads come together to provide a network of roads that give different things to different people on different journeys. Um, yet somehow we struggle to bring that across to the railways and we think if you've got a railway between A and B, why on earth would you need another one between A and B? You know, the fact that one of them may stop off a lot and uh, go to lots of towns and villages and deal with lots of different people and as, as I'm going back to the freight point covers freight um, might be entirely different to the people who need to get from A to B incredibly quickly without stopping and I think <clears throat> we sort of struggle as a country to recognize that our, our, our railways um, have different purposes and different users and different passengers and different freight customers and I think what NPR and TRU do in, in a very complementary way is is build that capability in a way that's been lacking over the, you know, as Tim said, not quick enough, but we're all working as quickly as we can. Um, you know, and it's a bit like my view of the London situation. No one, you know, no one in London is challenging Crossrail because because the, the East West. District line got new trains, you know, they're, they're both happening. So I think we, we need to sort of broaden our thinking and our horizons in, in, in the ambitions for what, we, what we're trying to build here. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. Um, so we've got another question here. 
Uh, and I, I think I've got a bit of a, a thought on it already, but I'd like you both to answer for the audience. Question for both. We've seen unabated demand for rail travel until recently. Some of my colleagues are concerned that we may have plateaued in terms of demand. Is this the case of build it now and they will come? Or do you risk building, building something that won't be used? Secondly, if we delay investment, will we potentially see the business cases eroded? I'll start with you, John, if you don't mind. Yeah, just that last bit was, will we see the business case eroded? Yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks. Um, you know, look, so obviously, uh, confidently predicting the future is a difficult game, but I think it's partly our, it, you know, it's our job as well because we're putting lots of money at stake here. Um, you know, I, I guess one, there's very, there's probably no parallel in anyone's lifetime um, about what's happening at the moment and the consequence. But, um, you know, I, I guess a few thoughts. One is, in 2008-9, in the in the Department for Transport, when the recession hit, there was a very strong view that all rail schemes at the start of what was then CP4, I think, um, should be cancelled. And actually, I'm pleased that we won the argument, which was that if you cancel schemes, the only thing you're ensuring is that when you do need them, you're not ready. Um, so my my instinct would be, to some degree, that applies as well. Um, you know, demand for tra you know, we all know kind of lesson one in learning about transport is that transport is a derived demand you know very few people do it for the sake of it um, and that's a function of population which which is growing it's a function of modal choice which i think rail is increasingly attractive you know my i don't have the stats to hand but you know i, I would hazard a guess that you don't need a big proportion of road users on this route to transfer to rail to completely swamp our services. You know, it's probably a few percent of road users switching to rail is a hundred percent increase, such is the small numbers on rail at the moment. So actually, you know, and that goes back to the first question as well. If you want any serious modal shift to, uh, to trains with their environmental and efficiency and their land use efficiency, you have to provide the capacity for people to be there. Um, and so I, I think that I think I guess you know my bet would be that this is the right thing to be doing, and we we should keep going, um, even if it's not the people we know now who travel. I think more people will transfer mode. I think the population will continue to grow, and those two things uh, and people's desire to travel. I think come once this is over, um, I, I think we'll be desperate to get out. I am. Um, so I fully agree. I fully agree with you there, John. And that's not just because I want to keep my job. Um, Thank you very much for that. I'll uh, go to Tim for the same question, if you don't mind, Tim. So pre-COVID-19, um, the basic um, use of railways in the north of England has doubled in the last 20 years. So that's 180 million passenger journeys per year. And we projected by 2050, that would have grown to 760 million passenger journeys, which, of course, the biggest station we have in the north uh, is over at Leeds. So a, a, a magnitude of growth. What does that represent to the traveling public every day? Actually just 1.2% of us in the North use the train. It's 98% of us are using fossil fuel vehicles every day. So that modal shift into public transport, you've got to consider active travel, using a train that's fully electrified, and having the capacity on the train to be able to move even more people about. So an increase of 4% of those train journeys, sorry, from people out of cars onto the train journeys, would just break the system. That's where we are at the moment. So what we need to do is we need to put this investment in place. It takes far too long to build new railways. It takes far too long to do major infrastructure works. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at how we can fast pace these programs to actually get them out to market and get them built. But just consider this, between North Birmingham and Glasgow, there's just one motorway east-west, and that's the M62. 360 days a year, you stop on it solid three times. Only five days in a year does that motorway work and it's getting fuller and fuller and fuller. And they're not going to build a new motorway between east-west. And I think you're going to see the pressure on the RIS program with Highways England, the £27 billion that's been announced. 
a lot of new road building in there. Why are you going to do that? I thought what we're trying to do was get people out of their cars. So, okay, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, but they are still some time away. You saw the Heathrow decision with Heathrow and its third runway. A lot of ramifications and consequences through these legal judgments. And actually what we signed up to, which is that carbon reduction by 2050. So as we move forward, I think these key drivers will play a really big part in actually strengthening our business case. In the north, we will never have strong BCRs because we haven't got the strength in the economy. They have in the southeast, but not in the north of England. So as we get stronger, we build these, we build the economy, then of course, we will be set far better to have wonderful things like probably Hyperloop in 40 or 50 years, but that is unproven technology at the moment. So for us, it's invest in that train, those longer trains, those quicker trains, those ones that have got all that capacity for us. So I do not see this government taking the foot off the pedal. Now, I remember the manifesto, the first item with the Conservatives was Brexit, get that done. The second one was build NPR. And that's what we're going to do. I guess um, I, I completely see where you're coming from with the M62. Um, I used to, I know John said for my sins, he, he said for my sins, I used to work in a consultancy. I used to work in medical sales, going back and forth on that motorway, and it's absolutely horrific. Um, so glad to be on there, being able to get the train across to Manchester these days, working for the railway. But um, I, I agree with both both you and you and John on that, on, on those answers. Thank you very much. Um, John, would, would you mind if we tried to use your webcam again? Because it just feels a little bit lonely, me and Tim here. Uh, you, yeah, your, audio your audio has worked quite well. I don't know if you want to try and share that and we can see how it goes. Do I need to do something? Oh, yeah. uh, there we go. You've joined us. Um, okay, so, John, a uh, question for you. Uh, someone someone says, and I can't, I can't see the name, I do apologise to those, I'm at, uh, those people asking the questions. Um, Thank you for a really interesting interview, uh, overview, sorry, that's my, my reading. Does a public performance measure of around one in 10 trains being late feel ambitious enough as a target considering the scale of the project? Have you found there is a challenge when speaking with stakeholders? Do the targets and outcomes set by the DFT feel like the right measures for the programme? Um, Do the targets and outcomes feel like the right measures for the program? Gosh, what a good question. Um, yeah, were you going to come in there, Ollie? Sorry. Um, I don't know if it's just, I think it might just be a delay with your audio, but let's keep going with this question, John, and see how we run. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, gosh, that's a very good question. I, I think. Um, I think we need to keep keep testing them, I think is where I am with the targets and outcomes for the program. I think the targets and the outcomes for TRU came about some years ago, and I think they came about before we knew the price of everything. And I think there's a natural moment in these projects and in the RNET process, to use my favorite acronym, whereby you're forced to keep retesting that what you once thought was a good idea to buy is still a good idea to buy. And I think that will force a very kind of healthy discipline on us. Um, so I think you don't have to be uh, particularly uh, uh, brainy or travel on the route at all much to spot that the capacity one seems like a very obvious one to deal with. Similarly, that you just have to look at the performance charts and, you know, a bit like poor Tim stuck on the Castlefield corridor uh, every day, you know, you, you will see the pain of performance on this route. So they, they do stand up, I think, to the sort of feedback we get from transport focus and passengers, as well as the data we get about the performance of the route and it is overcrowding. Um, I think the journey time one, and this is a personal view, I think we've got to think really carefully about when we make improvements, do we put, put them towards reducing journey times or do we put them towards um, improving performance? I think that's a really interesting one and one of the areas I'm really keen to work at this year is to make sure we've got the right balance across the system. So 
not just that the infrastructure is right, that we've optimized the rolling stock to fit on the infrastructure and that we then optimize the timetable. And then we optimize the franchising arrangements, and the operations so that the railway system works. And my sense is as we go through that process, we'll be able to understand where we're getting the best return on our investment, where we might want to sort of slow things down or drop them from the program. Um, and I don't know where that will end up yet. I, I don't. I think it's the right thing to do. I think we'll have to do it before we get through the next government gateway, the final deliver one. Um, so at the moment, I, I think it's doing an awful lot of good things. We're going to challenge ourselves to see if we can do any better. Um, uh, and we'll put the results to the department and the Treasury over the coming uh, years. Thank you very much, John. Uh, sort of echoing your earlier points about it being very fluid in the project and program environment that we work in. Um, and I guess it's quite, we've got to seven o'clock now, so I don't want to keep you two for too much longer. Um, but if you don't mind, I'll put one more question to Tim and then close. Are you happy with that? Okay, okay brilliant. Um, Tim, question from me, and I, I guess we've sort of touched on that a little bit, but just uh, as, a, as a sort of more, more solid, direct to the point question, uh, what is the government's commitment to Northern Powerhouse Rail? And, and how do you sort of feel that the recent changes in government has given uh, or, or detracted energy from these programmes? So for us, each time we've asked for the money for the following year for the grant funding, we've got it. And the reason we've got it is because the government know that we are on programme and we are on budget. Now, although we may look a bit like a swan going across the lake, we are paddling like hell underneath uh, with a really good strong team to make sure that we make that best case for the north of England for this investment. So we've seen no let up and of course with COVID-19 and with the amount of money that's been spent by the Treasury to actually just keep the country functioning, um, you always run a risk of a programme being slowed down or actually curtailed. But we've been asked a question what can we accelerate? What can we bring forward on NPR to actually motivate and drive a solution far quicker that actually adds benefits uh, to the economy as soon as possible? And that's where we come back to, let's do the surveys. Let's have a look at some of the stations. So there's a couple of new stations on NPR. They're already going to be an existing network rail infrastructure. Can we start to progress those now? and get them designed and built. Because I think it's really important that when we talk here, we're talking about the engineering. What we're not talking about is the politics. And the politics and the engineering sometimes don't mix. But if you put them together in a certain collaborative way, it gets a strong message across. And that's the key bit. Stick with the strong messages. So for us, we're sticking with the program, we're sticking with the budget, we're going to deliver the SOC and work collaboratively with, of course, our colleagues in TRU and absolutely supporting them. I just think one comment back on the question to John earlier. He's really dealing with an old Victorian railway that twists and turns all over the place, very much like one of our corridors is the Hope Valley between Sheffield and Manchester. And when you're looking at the CP6 scheme, 100 odd million pounds there, we're actually into the billions. And we're going from three fast trains an hour, which is what Network Rail will be able to achieve, to four fast trains an hour when NPR is built. And the magnitude of the cost is clearly reflecting the difficulties of the train. And we have a lot in the north. We have a Pennine, uh, uh, you know, Pennines that are in the way. So we will have to bore some considerable tunnel length through the Pennines as our predecessor had done. But what a fantastic showcase for the North. What a fantastic legacy that will be leaving all this training, all these world-class experts that will be bringing out of these schemes that can go around the world. So it's not just the burn of cash to build a job. It's all the training, it's the legacy, and actually leaving a network that will help drive that economic benefit through the economy in the North of England. And of course, level it up. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, really good.
good answer to, to the question to finish. Um, I'll just say there was um, some slides I was sent by uh, Justin Moss, uh, who works at Siemens and is part of the Northern Rail Industry Leaders Group, um, hosted by RIA, and they've done some analysis on your SLBC that was released in 2015, and they predicted based on that spend, um, the peak of uh, workforce required would be around 90,000 uh, skilled workers, and that's an increase uh, from today, which, um, you know, it, it, well, it's magnitudes lower, essentially. And I think that quite demonstrates your point quite well about the uh, the need for the young world professionals, um, other um, institutions that encourage people to get into our, our railway um, and how important they are. I think I'd just like to say for those that don't know, the young world professionals um, to put on these sorts of events to inspire and develop the next generation of railroad professionals. There is further opportunities to develop your network and your knowledge by getting involved in one of our regional committees. And if you are interested, please do get, get in touch with me um, or respond to one of the emails you'll receive um, following, this, following this talk. Um, it's also important to mention the YRP are an organisation run entirely by volunteers and we couldn't run without without them or our corporate members uh, for which we're very grateful uh, for, the, for the investment they give give to us so we can continue to do these sorts of things um, also note there is the 2021 uh, there's the 2021 um, deadline for uh, signing up with the YRP coming up, which I've been I've been told to communicate. Um, so a quick reminder: there's that three question survey that if you could fill out would really would really help the YRP with future events, uh, knowing what you think of this, so we can improve, and also putting on more of what you want to see in the future. Um, before I finish, Tim. John, is there anything that you would like to say? Your sort of final, final words. Um, that sounds quite menacing, but it's not meant to be. <laughs> well, look, I mean, from my point of view, um, I just think it's been really important the amount of people that have actually uh, joined this webinar, uh, and hopefully you've taken something away from it. We are one big rail family. We're a really strong family. We've got uh, a lot of tradition, a lot of heritage. And I think we've got a lot of legacy to leave. So it's really important that, you know, you continue your support for YRP. And I'm happy to uh, to take any further questions from people. Um, that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and also, I think let's have some more of these because I'm really happy to talk about the progress on the program, where the opportunities are, and how people can come and collaborate further with us. But, you know, thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening. And again, once more, apologies for last time. Uh, didn't didn't go as well as we expected. Uh, but this time uh, we did. Uh, I will bring some slides next time. I just thought it was important just to uh, uh, to articulate where we are in terms of uh, terms of the program. But thank you very much, Oliver. Well, that was a really, really fantastic uh, talk, Tim, and really, really um, enjoyed the questions, the answers to the questions that you gave as well. John, is there anything that you would like to say uh, before I close? No, uh, thank, thank you for thank you for the invite, and I'll echo everything Tim said. Thank you very much. Um, okay, with all, with all said and done, I would like to say um, again a huge thank you to Tim, John. Um, really, really good talks. Really, really interesting. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to um, Isabella Lawson, the Vice Chair of the South East Committee, and Elliot Jordan, the Vice Chair of my committee, for their help in uh, facilitating this event in the background. Really appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, all the best, everyone. Stay safe. Cheers, Tim. Thank you. Cheers, John. Thank you. Bye.